This video is an introduction to the dplyr package in R. Uh, dplyr is a package for data manipulation and exploration written by Hadley Wickham of ggplot2 fame and author of many other packages. Um, dplyr is the next iteration of plyr uh, and it's focused exclusively on data frames. So I use and I love dplyr because it saves me time its performance is very good, but even more importantly, it saves me time writing and reading code because the syntax just feels like how our code should be written. So I'm going to start by describing the functionality of dplyr briefly, and then we're going to walk through a lot of example code. So this is an R Markdown document in our studio, and I'll publish it to our pubs and link to it below the video and you can browse through that after and use it as a quick reference guide uh, to this content. So let's get started. We've already talked about why I use dplyr, so now I'll go through some of the basic functionality. There are five basic verbs, filter, select, arrange, mutate, and summarize, and uh, there's also this ancillary verb called group by. It's not really one of the verbs, but it's used a lot with summarize. dplyr can work with data stored in databases and data tables. So if your data is not in R, but it's locked away in a database and it would be inconvenient to uh, transfer it or you just don't want to learn SQL, uh, dplyr can allow you to work with it without leaving R. Uh, dplyr provides four different types of joins. An uh, inner, a left, a semi-join, and an anti-join. I'm not covering these in the presentation. Uh, dplyr also has some window functions for things like ranking, offsets, and other things. Hadley recommends dplyr if you're only working with data frames, though I will note it doesn't yet duplicate all of the plyr functionality, um, even if you're working just with data frames. Now, the examples below are based on the latest release as of today, uh, so that's version 0.2, which was released in May. So, let's start with some code. Um, we're going to load dplyr, and that will mask a few base functions. Um, now, if you also use plyr, Hadley recommends that you load plyr first. And then the data set we're going to work with is called hflights. Um, it's in a package, and it's, it's flights departing from two Houston airports in 2011. Um, we're going to load the data with the data command, and then pull up the head just to, to take a glance. Um, each row of the data is a flight. Uh, we have the date, departure time, arrival time, carrier, uh, fields re related to how long the flight took, and delays, etc. Uh, so you'll see a lot more of that below. Now, we're actually going to convert this data frame to what's called a local data frame um, with this tbl underscore df command. And I'm going to store that in a local data frame called flights. Now, a local data frame is simply a wrapper for a data frame, and it has a nice, nice printing properties, but other than that, it's basically the same as a data frame. So as you might know, if you just printed the H flights uh, data frame to the screen, you would see all the rows and it would fill up your screen and eventually say, you know, exceeded max length of screen or something like that. Um, when you print a local data frame, uh, it's much nicer. Um, as you can see, it, it tells you at the top the number of rows and columns. It only shows as many columns as will fit on your screen, and then for the ones it doesn't show you, it tells you about them. So you can see that if I just increase my screen width and rerun this command, uh, I see more columns this time because it knows my screen can fit them. So Now, if you want to see more rows, you can use the print command and use this argument n equals, and this will show me 20 rows instead of the default of 10. And then sometimes you just want to take a look at all the columns, and you don't want to do the str command, 
Um, so the easiest way I found is just do a head of, of the data of the local data frame and then coerce it to a regular data frame. And as you can see, we're now looking at kind of a regular data frame printout. So now we're going to move on to the first verb, which is filter. And this is how you keep rows matching a criteria. So this is the base R approach for how you, um, how you do filtering of rows. So I'll just run that real quick. And as you can see, because this flights is a local data frame, it, um, it prints like a local data frame even though I'm running base R commands. Anyway, as you probably know, you first write the name of the data frame and then you repeat it and um, you write the conditions, and I should have said the conditions are month equals one and day of month equals one. So that's um, viewing all flights on January 1st. And then I have to remember putting a comma and then a space and then the closing bracket. So it's a little bit awkward. Um, so the dplyr approach um, is simpler to write and to read, and it's this right here. And so I'll run that, and you'll see it produces the identical result. Uh, note that the command structure is to first um, write the name of the local data frame or regular data frame, uh, then write a condition and a comma, and then write any other condition. And the comma, it interprets as an and. You can also use an ampersand if you prefer. Um, and it returns a, it returns a data frame and just also note that, um, like all dplyr commands, nothing is modified in place. This, this didn't, for instance, remove any rows from flights. It just showed you a view of that. Uh, one other note that uh, you might have noticed that um, uh, the row names are included um, in the case when you use the base R command but dplyr uh, generally discards row names. So if you store anything in a row name, you'll want to uh, write that to an explicit variable. Um, note that you can use a pipe for the or condition. And um, uh, you can also use the in infix operator if you, if you prefer that. Um, just note that in the case of, of using this first construct, you do have to write the uh, variable name twice, um, so the in, infix operator is kind of nice. So that's filter. Um, select is the next verb, and this is where you pick columns by name. Now again, I'll show you the base R approach for selecting these three columns. Just run that. And basically I have to do um, open bracket, comma, and then create a character vector, and then put these annoying uh, quotation marks around each column name. It's kind of painful to write and sometimes even hard to remember. Uh, the dplyr approach instead looks exactly like the filter command. First, you write the name of the data frame, and then you just uh, separate between with commas the names of the columns you want to include. Uh, so this is named select just because it does the same thing as a SQL select. Um, and I'll, I'll just run this right now. You can also do kind of fancier things in the select function. So let me run this and then I'll tell you about it. So this is a way to say I want to keep all the columns between year and day of month. So you can see it kept all three columns here. Uh, I, want to, I want to keep all columns containing taxi. And as you can see, there's two here. And the same thing with contains delay. So uh, these two here. Now note that other than contains, there's other similar functions like starts with, ends with, and then matches, which does regular expressions if you want to get really fancy. But yeah, that's about all there is for select. Um, next, let's talk about chaining. So this is not a verb. This is not a dplyr verb. Um, this is kind of a brief diversion to talk about how you should write your dplyr code for easiest readability. Um, this is called chaining or pipelining. Now, think um, before I talk about it, let me just show you uh, some code. So let's say I want to select 
the unique carrier and departure delay columns. And then I want to filter for delays over 60 minutes. How would I do that? Well, normally I would use nested parentheses like you do all over R. So here's the command, and I'll run it. And it's not that hard to read, but notice that you do have to, it does take you a few seconds to kind of parse through it. So first I read the name of the data frame here. Then I read I want to select. Then I jump over here to read what I want to select. Then I jump over here to read what I want to do next. Then I jump over here to see um, what the filter condition is. So it takes a lot of jumping around and you almost immediately forget what you just read. Um, so chaining is the alternative way to write dplyr code. And I put it on three lines just for readability. Note that it doesn't actually have to go on three lines. But it uses this little operator um, percent greater than percent which is an operator from the McGritter package. Um, it's imported from McGritter, so you don't have to use dplyr to use this. But basically, you read it out loud as, as the word then. So you say flights, then select unique carrier and departure delay, then filter by departure delay greater than 60. And I'll run that. So, it's much easier to read. You'll notice that I don't have to repeat flights because basically the uh, this operator says take take the um, take what you just did and put it as the first argument, and then take the output of this, and then uh, put it as the first argument here. So you don't have to rewrite it. And again, you can just write commands kind of in a natural order. Now, note that you can use this operator in R commands outside of dplyr. So I'll just show you real quick. Um, we're going to just create two vectors and then calculate the Euclidean distance between them. And even with just a few parentheses, I personally find this a tiny bit confusing to read because your, your brain is just gets a little confused about where the opening and clothing, closing parentheses should be. Um, and you can write the equivalent with the chaining like this. So x1 minus x2 squared, then take the sum, then take the square root. It's very straightforward and easy to read. So ev for the rest of this tutorial, I'm going to be doing basically all of the code with chaining. So next, we're going to go back to the verbs. And we're now on the third verb, and it's called arrange. And it's how you reorder rows. So um, I'll just show you the base R approach very quickly for selecting these two columns, unique carrier and departure delay. And then you sort by departure delay. You use this order function. Uh, the dplyr approach um, is much simpler. So flights, then you select which columns, then you just define which column you want to sort by. Um, and it's ascending sorting by uh, by default. Um, so it starts with the smallest negative number and then goes up. Uh, and then um, if you want to do descending, you just wrap the variable name with DESC. And so now you'll see that our uh, largest departure delays are at the top of the list. So uh, now we'll move on to our fourth verb called mutate, and it's how you add new variables, usually ones that are functions of existing variables. Um, so here's the base R approach. If you want to make a new variable called speed in miles per hour, you would just write it with the dollar sign speed, and then you'd assign it based upon your calculation, um, and then you could see your results, uh, and I'll just do this, and you could see your results by selecting out those columns. So the dplyr approach um, is to use this command called mutate. So first I'm selecting, then I'm mutating. And um, you'll see that in the mutate command, I just define the variable name here, the new variable name. And then when I refer to existing column names, I don't have to use a dollar sign or anything like that. Now, note that this does not store the new variable anywhere. 
Um, it just prints it and then it's gone. Um, so if you want to store the new variable, you just need to run it um, and assign it. Uh, so I'm running this on flights with the mutate command and then I'm, uh, I'm assigning it to flights. Now also note that I didn't actually have to select things in order to use them for mutation. I was just doing that so you could see the results, but you can mutate anything even if you haven't selected it. And our final verb is summarize, which is to reduce variables to values. Now before I get into it, I know that some people spell summarize with a Z. Uh, Hadley does not. You can actually use the Z spelling for summarize. At the moment, you can't use uh, the Z spelling for this function summarize each. You have to use the S at the moment. So I would just recommend always writing it with the S and you'll get used to it. Um, so uh, summarizing, it's easiest to understand with an example. Summarizing is when you um, group data by some variable and then you want to uh, aggregate it with some function. So if my goal is to calculate the average arrival delay to each destination, what I do is I group by the destination and then I say for each group, summarize it by calculating the mean arrival delay and assign that to a new variable called average underscore delay. Now, because there are NAs, I have to do this na.rm equals true, um, but let's just run that. Um, so as you can see, there's 116 results, which tells me that there must have been 116 destinations, because when you group by something and then summarize, the result um, you're, you're doing a summary on each one of the items in the group. So again, this is the average delay for this destination. Now, you can do this in base, base R. Um, a fast way is T apply, though is, and I'm just showing the head of the result. Um, as you can see, it's kind of cumbersome to write and remember what order to put things in. Um, aggregate, you can also do it's a little slower, maybe a little bit easier to read, um, but you know I, I certainly um, uh, prefer the dplyr approach. Um, now we're going to do um, some new functions, uh, summarize each, and then there's an also another one just like it called mutate each that I'm not going to cover, but you should get the idea. So summarize each allows you to apply the same summary function to multiple columns at once, and it'll become obvious why this is useful. So um, let's, for each carrier, cal let's calculate the percentage of flights that were canceled or diverted. So anytime you read the words, if you're trying to figure out what code to write, anytime you read the words for each something, that usually means you need to write it in a group by. So flights group by carrier, and then I want to calculate the percentage of flights canceled or diverted. So canceled and diverted are actually just um, uh, zero and one columns. So I can take a mean of a zero or one column. Zero means not canceled, one means canceled. So I can take a mean to determine uh, what, what number of flights were canceled. So again, for each carrier, I want to take the mean. And with summarize each, you, um, you use this little funds function. It's where you define whatever function you want to run. And then after that, you list out which columns you want to run it on. So let me run that real quick, show you the result. So um, there are 15 carriers in the data set. So for American Airlines, you know, 1.8% of flights were canceled from this data set and 0.18 percent were diverted, um, and then on and, on and on for each, each carrier. Now you can actually do um, more complicated things here. Um, I'll show you how you can do two functions at once, but um, the other thing you can do is you can actually just 
match um, column names with matches or uh, contains or starts with or ends with. Um, so that way if you have, say, uh, 50 columns, all that start with some certain uh, set of characters and you need to take the mean of all of them, you don't have to write uh, summarize and then 50 different commands. You just write this summarize each and you write funds mean. So uh, let's do another example, slightly more complex, and I'll run it first. And um, what I've done, again, I'm grouping by carrier. And then for each carrier, I want to calculate the minimum and maximum arrival and departure delays. So here's where I say, I use summarize each once again, and here's where I say in funds, I want to use both min and max. And because there are NAs, I actually have to tell for each of those functions, I need to say, okay, also when you're running the NA, remove the, sorry, when you're running min, remove the NAs, and when you're running max, remove the NAs. And this little dot is um, just kind of a placeholder for the, for the data you're passing in. Um, so that's how you write it. I know it's a little more complicated in lots of parentheses, but it's not too bad as long as you're using the chaining. Um, so anyway, I've defined the two functions here. And then down here, I'm saying I want to match the delay, um, match any columns with the word delay in it. So as you can see in the result, for each carrier, I've got the minimum and the maximum for both arrival delay and departure delay, and it even kind of creates these um, useful variable names for me. So a little bit more with summarizing. Um, I'm going to introduce two pretty simple uh, what I call helper functions. One is this n function, and it counts the number of rows in a group. And then the other is this helper function n distinct which counts the number of unique items in a vector. So you'll see how this is used. So let's say if for each day of the year, I, I want to count the total number of flights and then sort them in descending order. So um, since we have this for each, we know we're going to group. So we're going to group by month and day of month. Um, and you can indeed group by as many variables as you like. And then to count the total number of flights, what we're actually just doing is running this n function, and we're assigning the result to a new variable called flight count. So all this n function is doing is counting the number of rows in the group. And since one row represents one flight, this n represents the flight count. And then after summarizing, I'm just arranging in descending order. Um, so as you can see, uh, you know, August the 4th had 706 flights, August the 11th, same thing. Um, and you know a lot of times to diagnose whether you're doing a summary, a summarize command correctly, um, you should just look at how many results you're getting back. Now we know there are 365 days of the year, so this hints that we've probably written our summarize function correctly. Now, um, there's actually a handy little function called tally. We're going to rewrite this, uh, what we just wrote. And you'll run it, and you'll see it looks exactly, almost exactly the same. Um, but basically, anytime you run a summarize and then this end function, you can usually replace it with a tally. Um, and the fact that we're arranging in descending order by that thing, I can just write sort equals true. So again, this is doing almost exactly the same as this, other than the fact that um, the column name when you use tally is just an n, and the column name when you use, uh, when you use the n function, uh, you can define it. Um, uh, if there's a way to define this uh, column name, I, I don't know what it is. Um, so we're going to do one more uh, summarize function here. And uh, this is going to use that n distinct helper function I mentioned. So here, for each destination, we want to count the total number of flights and the number of distinct planes that flew there. 
So we know how to do the total number of flights. Um, we summarize and then flight count equals n. Um, plane count equals n distinct tail num. Now note that when we calculate plane count, it's not referring to this in some way. So just forget that this is here. So n distinct is basically saying within each group, how many distinct tail num. And tail num is an identifier for a plane that's unique. So let's run this. So as you can see, um, we noticed earlier that there are 116 destinations, and you've seen these plane, flight count. Um, and so flight count is the number of flights to that destination, and here are how many planes went to that destination. Um, and final, finally, kind of related to summarizing, usually you group when you're going to summarize, but this can sometimes be useful even if you aren't summarizing. So in this case, for each destination, I want to show the number of canceled and not canceled flights. So I'm going to group by destination, select the column I want, and then send it to the table, and then send it to the head. So um, as you can see, it produces this nice table for me um, of each destination, and then just a count of not canceled and canceled. Um, very handy, and uh, just remember that you can pass, you can use um, other base R functions in combination with um, these dplyr functions, and this is a, a good example. Now we're going to move on to window functions, which are, which are a bit more advanced, and the code gets a little longer and a little more complicated to write and read, but um, Basically, I'm going to contrast window functions with aggregation functions. So an aggregation function, like a mean, it takes n inputs and returns one value. So what that means is if I give you um, a vector with 10 items and I say give me the mean, it returns one value. Um, and that's the mean of that vector. So that's an aggregation function. A window function takes n inputs and returns n values. So these are things like ranking and ordering functions, uh, offset functions, and cumulative aggregates. So you know, if I say here's a vector of 10 numbers and I want you to rank them, you're going to give me back 10 ranks. That's why it's a window function, not an aggregation function. So let's, uh, let's do an example here. This is um, for each carrier, we want to calculate which two days of the year they had their longest departure delays. Now, um, let me just run the code, and then we'll look at it, and then we'll talk about how we came up with it. So again, for each carrier, and there's 15 carriers, so I have 30 rows, calculate which two days of the year they had their longest departure delays. So American Airlines, on December, December 12th, they had 970-minute delay, and November 19th, a 677-minute delay, um, et cetera, for each, each carrier. So how we did that is we first grouped by carrier. Then we selected the columns uh, we want to show. So I, I chose month, day of month, and departure delay. And here's the, the real workhorse function. So um, we're going to filter the rows by min rank of descending of delay of departure delay. So um, think focus on this part right here. Um, so we're doing the min rank, the minimum rank, um, and making it less than or equal to two. In other words, we're taking the departure delays, we're ranking them, and we're getting the first two. Now, because um, it's, a little, it's a little confusing, but the smallest, not largest values get ranked as 1 by these ranking functions. So if you think of the first rank as the largest, then you have to do DESC to reverse it. So I want the largest departure delays, which is why I'm doing um, descending and then min rank less than or equal to 2, and then filter to only include those. And then finally, 
um, we're going to arrange by carrier and then descending departure delay. Now, um, just like we used uh, the tally function before to simplify some code, I'm going to use the top n function to simplify this code. And we'll run it again, and you can see it's the same. So uh, basically, top n replaces this whole filter min rank descending less than or equal to 2. So it saves a lot of typing, and it's conceptually kind of makes a lot of sense. I want the top two in that group. Um, and it's selected automatically by departure delay. Um, there's a way, there's, there's supposed to be a way you can choose what uh, column top end will select, but that currently has a bug in the current release, 0 0.2. So um, right now, by default, it just selects DEP delay um, as the one uh, that you want to take the top two of. Now let's do um, let's do another example of a window function. This time the function is called lag, and um, let me just run it, and then we'll talk about it. So what I'm saying in this is for each month we want to calculate the number of flights, which is easy, just this flight count equals n, and the change from the previous month. So as you can see in January. There were 18,910 flights. In February, there's this number. March, there's this number. This column represents the change from the previous month. So it's an offset function. So how did I do that? So I grouped by month, of course, summarize, and then this n. And then I mutate, and I say change equals flight count, the thing I just created minus lag of flight count. So lag means just look at the earlier value, and there's another function called lead, which looks at the next value. So um, once again, tally, as you, you might remember, tally is good when you have summarize and then the end function. Um, so we can actually rewrite this more simply with, with the tally function. Now, because I can't define flight count, uh, I, I, I just refer to it as n, so I can refer to it as n minus lag of n. And as you can see, n is used here, but the change column looks exactly the same. So there are a few more convenience functions uh, that I like to use. Um, this is an easy way to randomly sample a fixed number of rows, and by default, it's without replacement. So in this case, it does show me row numbers. Um, but it's pulling back five uh, random rows from the data set. You can also uh, use sample frac to sample a fraction of rows, a percentage of rows. And in this case, I just use the replace equals true argument to say that we're going we're gonna to sample with replacement in this case. And as you, as you can see, I got 56,000 rows. Um, Let's say you want to look at the structure of an object. You're probably very familiar with str, str, so we'll do that real quick. And the base str can be kind of ugly, as you might have noticed. It's a little hard to read. You can see that since my screen is narrow, we've got some wrapping that's annoying. Um, glimpse is the dplyr approach to str, and it's just got some nicer formatting. So as you can see, it, um, it doesn't have any wrapping. Um, it puts column, uh, sorry, it puts commas between each to make it easier to read, and it tries to fit exactly as many as can fit on your screen. So again, just like um, printing a local data frame, if I increase my screen width and, and uh, redid glimpse, it would again, sh it would show me more data on each line. Um, finally, uh, we're going to um, we're going to talk about connecting to databases. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, dplyr can connect to a database and uh, query on that data as if the data was loaded into a data frame. So this means that if you've got some data in a database and you don't want to transfer it to, into R, but you do want to use R and you want to use dplyr, you can do it. And I'm going to demonstrate that. Um, I'll show you that it uses the same syntax.
Um, it only generates select statements, so you can't update your data using uh, dplyr. Um, here are the databases that are currently supported. Uh, SQLite, uh, Postgres, Redshift, MySQL, MariaDB, BigQuery, MonetDB. Um, and I'm going to show uh, an example using an, uh, an SQLite database that contains the HFlights data. Um, if you want to do this on your own, there's an excellent, one of the many excellent vignettes um, on CRAN is the databases vignette, and it shows you how to create this database yourself. So uh, let's walk through the commands. Um, first, we will connect to a database that contains the HFlights data. So we just use this source uh, src sqlite command. And, um, uh, and all we've done is created a database connection to MyDB. Then we're going to use this tbl command to connect to the hflights table in that database. And this isn't copying any data. This is just setting up a connection um, to that table. So let's do a query with our data frame, not the database, and watch um, and just watch on the right side of the screen. It's a simple command, and it ran very quickly. We're just selecting two columns and then arranging by one of them. Now let's do the same identical query using the database. And you'll notice I all I have to do is swap out from flights to flights TBL, and I can run the exact same query. You'll notice it ran a little more slowly, um, but it did run. Um, and it tells you that the source is SQLite. Um, a couple more things with databases. Uh, if you already know SQL, you can actually just write the SQL commands yourself. And let's run that. And as you can see, that ran very quickly. Um, and then if you want to know what SQL commands uh, dplyr is using, you can actually just use this explain function and say, tell me you know, what function, what SQL you're writing. And it shows, you, it, uh, it shows you the SQL right here, and it shows you the execution, the query execution plan, in case you're interested. So that's about it. Um, I've listed a couple of resources that you might find useful. Um, a lot of this, this is, these are the resources I used when building this presentation. Um, the, uh, the official documentation on CRAN and the vignettes are very well written and they cover a lot um, that I did not cover here. Um, Hadley Wickham recently did a webinar about ddplot, sorry, about dplyr, and it also included ggviz. Um, and that was more of a high-level uh, conceptual webinar. Uh, Hadley also recently did a uh, tutorial that was very detailed and excellent. Um, it was at the USAR conference in 2014. And um, it's, it has a similar format to what I've used here, but it uses a lot more examples. Um, this is a Dropbox link, and um, it includes the slides, the code, and even some data files. It uses some flights data, though it's, it's different than this flights data I've shown you. And finally, there's the GitHub repo because it's developed on GitHub, and then the list of releases if you want to keep up with the latest changes and new functions and bug fixes. So thanks so much for watching, and I hope you got a lot out of this tutorial.